Hello and welcome uh, to the April Fields Math Ed Forum. Uh, today we're going to be, uh, we're happy to be together with uh, the joint event at Brock University, the Symposium on Coding, Computational Modeling, and Equity in Mathematics Education. Before we start the, um, uh, the, the session, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences resides as part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We'd like to acknowledge and express gratitude to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabek peoples who continue to share their ancestral lands with us. Just in terms of ground rules, since we are gonna be doing a bit of a hybrid or remote uh, virtual session today, uh, we do encourage uh, those who are uh, participating to uh, please your, leave your microphone on mute unless you're sharing. Uh, you may want to also uh, control the video to turn it off unless you're looking to present yourself. Um, and, um, you know, as always, uh, we all we always want to encourage it a respectful uh, collegial uh, atmosphere through um, uh, stimulating discourse. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us uh, uh, for this uh, for this forum today. Before we get going, we would uh, like to get any new reports uh, from the um, uh, from the various mathematics education organizations uh, that are active within uh, within Canada. Uh, so um, if you have something to share, uh, I, we definitely encourage uh, you to post directly into the um, uh, into the uh, chat uh, so that uh, we can broad, broaden that uh, uh, that update to others in the field. And uh, just to start off with uh, first year math, uh, uh, the first year math group, um, it, they're organizing a one day online conference uh, on Thursday, May 11th. Uh, it's gonna be starting at 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time. Uh, and uh, you should be able to register for free using this link, firstyearmath.ca uh, and, uh, and get involved. Okay, and if there's any other um, any other uh, announcements, please feel free to use the chat uh, to uh, to pop them in. All right, so getting into the uh, uh, the main event for today, uh, I'll be handing it back over to Kitty uh, to give a, a brief introduction uh, to our schedule. Uh, okay, um, so welcome to uh, the Fields Method Forum. Uh, today we have a joint event between the Fields Institute and the Brock University, a symposium on coding, computational modeling, and equity in mathematics education. First, I would like to thank the symposium co-chairs, Chantal and Immaculate, for their work and collaboration. They accommodated the schedule for the forum and made this event possible. Uh, now, uh, this is how our day will look like. In the first uh, hour and a half, we will have the discussion panel on uh, challenges and opportunities of uh, integrating coding in mathematics uh, classrooms, led by Celia Holes from University College London. The panel will discuss what coding means, how it is learned and developed, and how it is used as a tool to think with and explore mathematics. Particularly, the discussion will focus on the interaction between mathematics and coding in a practice. Uh, you will meet our panelists shortly. They are George from Canada, Onam from South Korea, Simon from uh, France, and uh, Elena from Australia. Uh, at 11.30, we will have Richard from University College London react to the uh, discussion panel with a particular focus on a span of 70 years, the past, present, and future of coding and modeling in math education. Now, uh, let's welcome uh, Chantal and uh, Immaculate. Uh, give us a brief introduction about the symposium. Uh, 
<clears throat> yes. Um, hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to each one of you. I'm Chantal Buteau. I'm a professor from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Brock University. Oh, hi. I'm Immaculate Namkasa. I'm a professor in mathematics education at Western University. Uh, we are thrilled to see many of you join this joint symposium and Phil's Method Education Forum on coding, computational modeling, and equity in math education a hybrid session. The symposium participants are joining from Brock University, and the symposium organizers are very delighted to collaborate with the Math Education Forum in bringing you this panel discussion. This symposium is for practitioners, leaders, policymakers, administrators, and researchers from diverse backgrounds and situations. So on Wednesday, it was preceded by a half-day series of professional development workshops for pre- and in-service teachers. And this is our last day of the symposium, and we have about 65 participants in class, volunteers and guests. About of half of the participants are emerging graduate scholars and educators, and we are so thrilled to have that composition. And the participants, speakers, and leaders and presenters are, represent over 10 countries, um, including Australia, Brazil, Canada, and five provinces in Canada, um, and other countries, Colombia, France, Mexico, Netherlands, South Korea, Norway, USA, um, and with seven of his colleagues joining virtually to speak. So at the symposium, we sought to provide a forum on three critical themes, meanings and interactions between computational thinking and mathematical thinking. The second theme was integration of coding and computational modeling in mathematics at different levels and in teacher education. And the last but not least is the theoretical and practical understanding related to improving equity in this integration. So um, the symposium is part of two legacies. The first legacy is one of symposia organized at Western University. And this, the first one of this symposium was funded by the Fields Institute and um, was supporting um, and funding us for the symposium this year as well. This symposium was on online learning um, our colleague, Professor George Gandanidas and Dr. Bill Higginson, we are its leaders and organizers. Now this symposium um, featured Seema Papat and Robin Kay as the keynote speakers. And this was way back in 2001. So Seema Papat in the 1980s championed efforts outside of computer science courses that designed and researched opportunities for children, youth, and young adults to use computer tools, concepts, practices, and context, and context for learning and thinking. So during our past symposium, and as you'll see, as you see, there've been a few, um, Ontario experts have collaborated and interacted with Canadian and international experts. And would like to recognize the varied context of city explored at past symposiums, which have included um, computational literacies, including at this symposium, computational modeling, such as with micro worlds, including at this symposium as well, computational participation, computational thinking experiences and objects to think with, computational and mathematical thinking, um, as well as newer ones explored at this symposium, including mathematical digital competences and generative computing. The second legacy is one of a two decade history of engagement of teaching to use programming in project based mathematics courses at Brock University. Computational modeling has been integrated in undergraduate math courses in year one, two and three for mathematics major and for future math teachers in the Faculty of Math and Science. These MICA courses started in 2001, and MICA stands for Mathematics Integrated with Computers and Applications. 
the Brock research team came together with the Western research team more recently, starting in 2017, to co-organize symposia, forums, webinars, seminar series, and communities of practice. This collaboration was supported by federal government, provincial government, and fields funding. So the 2015 and 2017 symposium on coding and computational thinking, respectively in mathematics education, came at a crucial time when provincial, national, and international interests in this topic spurred a movement of curricular, pedagogical, and assessment revisions to include the development of these skills and the ways of thinking among students in primary school. In 2022 to 2021, for instance, the province of Ontario um, in Canada introduced learning and use of coding schools as part of its mathematics curriculum in grades starting from one to eight and now um, further to high school um, in the curriculum. And parallel to that, there were also international movements as well as in several other countries and in other curriculums beyond mathematics. So the program of, for international student assessment PISA for the first time ever in 2022 um, decided that CT as a component of mathematics literacy was to be included. It decided to assess it. Students should possess and be able to demonstrate CT skills as they apply to mathematics as part of their problem solving practices. Now PISA anticipates a reflection by participating countries on the role of city in mathematics curricula and pedagogy. This dramatic uptake of coding and computational modeling in school curricula around the world has been coupled with growing concerns. Most important is the concern of addressing historical, multi-generational and persistent inequities related to bias, discrimination, marginalization and injustices, and most recently, the complexities already resulting from use of algorithms and artificial intelligence tools in solving societal problems. At this symposium, we are convening to share, discuss, and build partnerships around approaches, perspectives, and experiences that advance our understanding on the questions of practical and theoretical nature, including how can we be working towards more equitable outcomes rather than reproducing injustices and limiting opportunities for certain groups of people to advance and meaningfully participate in computational spaces. How can coding and computational modeling be practically and meaningfully integrated in mathematics classroom across educational levels, including teacher education, in what ways to continue carefully defining computational thinking or CT, its nature and place in relation to mathematics. The symposium program and structure was converged on to provoke participants to tackle the emergent questions and those that uh, remain. The aim of the symposium then was to strengthen and facilitate more and broader partnerships, research programs, collaborations, and support emerging scholarship, as well as enrich public discourse and policy. The second aim was to support enhanced practice and research related to teaching with attention to equitable participation and learner outcomes. Our program contained three working groups, and many of you may recognize the names that you see on this slide. Two keynote speakers with Reactor on day one and as well on day two. The keynote session served to provoke us to tackle questions proposed in and emerging from our work in the working group sessions. The first of the two panel discussion was led by a chair who orchestrated pre presentations of three panelists, one of who was on site. And attendees were invited to submit a poster proposals to present their work. 
And finally, we had a pre-symposium PD activities. And again, here for many of those in, uh, in Ontario, you may recognize many names that you see here on the program. The symposium online proceedings will be available in a few months on the symposium website and including the recording of our plenary sessions. We invite uh, many of you to come and visit it when it is available. We would like to truly thank the organizing and program committee, which include emerging scholars and graduate students for their dedicated work under the leadership of their committee chairs. We also acknowledge Shirk, Fields, Callisto, and Brock, Faculty of Education, Faculty of Math and Science, and Western Education for funding the symposium. And on our own behalf as organizers and on behalf of the two research groups on computational modeling at Brock, led by Professor Buteau and the Group on Computational Participation at Western, led by Professor Namkasa, which have partnered in planning this symposium. We wish you a productive joint symposium and fields mathematics education session this morning. Chantal and I now pass it back to Anna um, Isabel Sacristan, a professor from Sinestav, Mexico, and also member of the Brock Research Group to introduce the chair of the practice focused panel. Thank you. Um, are you going to? Um, so I don't know if can you all hear me, those who are connected online or something? Yes, okay, good. So welcome to this panel discussion on practice, mathematics education incorporating coding, practical challenges and opportunities. And it is my pleasure to introduce um, the chair. And the chair is Dane Celia Hoyles, who is professor of mathematics education at the UCL Institute of Education and the Knowledge Lab in London, England. Celia was the first recipient of the International Commission of Mathematics Instruction Hans Gordon Gold Medal in 2004 for excellence in research. She was also the first recipient of the Royal Society Calvary Education Medal in 2011 for excellence in research. He has, she has honored doctors from the Open University, Loughborough University, and Sheffield Hallam University that I know of, maybe she has more. She was the United Kingdom's government's chief advisor for mathematics from 2004 to 2007, and the director of the National Center for Excellence in the Teaching of Mathematics from 2007 to 2013. She was also the president of the Institute of Mathematics and its Applications from 2014 to 2015. Celia was awarded the Order of the British Empire in 2004 and made the commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2014. Her major research interests have been in secondary students' conceptions of proof, the mathematical skills needed in modern workplaces, and the design of computer environments to engage students in learning of mathematics. And I hope um, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg of what we can be set up. And, um, if, if those online can use their microphones, please. Um, so it is my great pleasure to pass on the, the baton of this session to um, Celia, um, who will be chairing this panel discussion. So Celia. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Can you all hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you, Celia. Wonderful. And I'm so delighted and honoured to have been asked to chair this panel. Not only did it give me the opportunity to interact with all the panellists, but also with you, Anna, and with Chantal and Immaculate, that I want to thank you all very much for your patience. My only sadness is I'm not there with you. Um, you just, I just couldn't do it for various reasons. But I must say, it's not bad. At least I can sort of see you and interact with you and hear. And I, I want to say that Richard and I have um, watched some of the sessions before. Um, given the time um, differences, we didn't watch many of them live, but 
thank you very much, Chantal and, and Immaculate, for sending me the um, video link so we could join in a little bit. And I think it's actually proved to me that I didn't need proving, I suppose, that it's much better to be face to face than listening online, because I don't know, the doorbell rings and, you know, things happen when you're at home and you get distracted very easily. And I do think that I miss the interactions with all you guys over there, but I can imagine you're having a, a very good time. So to turn to our panel, you had yesterday, you looked very more theoretically, you had the keynotes. Oh, and by the way, I love the keynotes. And I should say a little bit of that uh, before uh, we start, but I, I, I think we are now turning much more to practice about what are the challenges about putting some of these ideas, whether it's computational thinking or computational link, uh, literacy, or I'm a bit sort of ordinary, I would say programming uh, in practice in schools to make a difference to mathematics learning. And this is something that uh, certainly I've been involved with for many, 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 many years. And I still think it's got wonderful potential. I still think it's got a lot of challenges. The potential are things that people have already mentioned. It's because it makes it dynamic, more um, involving for our students. Too much of mathematics is a, a passive, as people have said, it's just a text. It's something that's just something that school does to them as opposed to something that they are engaged with. And uh, I do think it's, uh, it has huge potential, although undoubtedly there are big challenges. And this uh, panel is going to be looking at some of those challenges. But absolutely, uh, it's uh, coding is a ubiquitous. It's something that's a phenomenon that's all over the world. All our kids, everywhere they're going, they're coding. They're doing it at home, in their clubs, whatever. And actually, since the horrible pandemic, everybody is much more computer literate. We all are doing this stuff all online. Probably not liking it very much, but we're all used to it. It's not so exotic as it used to be. So maybe that's an issue that actually plays. So it's going to be more equitable in the past um, than, than in the past. But what I'm particularly interested, and I, I think this will come out in our panel, is the way coding or programming is introduced in schools varies enormously depending on the politicians or the structures of the curriculum in the schools. For example, in uh, you've just heard that in Ontario, Coding and computing is part of mathematics. And I think in France, it's the same. Uh, I don't know, you, the, the, um, uh, our panelists will uh, talk about their own country. In my country, it's not. Computing is a separate subject, it's statutory. So it's part of the national curriculum. So that means it has to be done, it can't be forgotten, except it's not examined and so it probably is forgotten but then it does build up barriers between computing and mathematics because it's a separate thing. And a lot of computing teachers are desperately trying to learn the computing curriculum. And the last thing they wanna do is worry about its links to maths. So I think whatever way we do this computing stuff or this coding stuff, it introduces challenges. But I do think there are also the conceptual ones that were introduced in the theoretical um, panel. And I want to mention a uh, talk that Seymour Papert, who, who after all, um, I first met Andy in MIT donkey years ago uh, at one of the MIT conferences, and it was inspirational, all of those. And indeed, there was a bit of a literature beginning to be um, born out there, Andy, wasn't there? There was your book, and there was Al Kuoka's book, and Richard my book, and we were trying to make a literature on programming and mathematics. But anyway, it was exciting that what was going on in that particular time. And I think now with coding coming back, it's um, we've got more of the excitement. And I think we also must build on what we learned from the past about it. But I want to mention, uh, which I think encapsulates the problem. We invited Seymour Papert to come to London and he did a keynote at PME. And then all of you will know PME. This was donkey's years ago, 1986. It's quite a small conference then. And he, I remember he talked about logo and he talked about, and he proved the circle theorems, you know, that in every school mass curriculum, usually rather boringly done and seen as separate 
um, theorems as opposed to one big theorem and subsidiary ones. And he proved them with that nice unifying idea using turtle geometry. And I remember we, uh, Richard and I thought, wow, that's wonderful. Uh, what an amazing way to think about the circle theory. It's a new representational infrastructure, a new way to look at the, a new way to think about your maths. But half or more of the people in the audience were completely shocked and horror struck about it because, you know, how did it fit in with all the other things in the maths curriculum? So I think it, it shows, and of course then people didn't do it, but it shows how whatever in, innovation you have, it causes this disruption. And uh, soon after, you know, we'll all go back to what we were before. However, in terms of that, your previous speeches, I think yesterday, I'm an activist. I'm much more, I'm involved more in, mainly in policy now. And I think we should change maths. Maths is a very boring subject in schools. Everybody does it, but half the people don't know why they're doing it. And when you think what a beautiful subject it could be, I think we should all be activists. However, I need to shut up now. Uh, I was allowed a little bit and I've now started and want to introduce my panel. And the panel is, uh, there are four people, two men and two women, so we're nicely equitable, and they're from different countries with different jurisdictions. And I'm going to introduce them in the net, in the order in which they will speak. Uh, there's Onnam Kwon, who is online, uh, and she is from the Department of Mathematics Education, Seoul National University in Korea. Welcome, Onnam. Sorry that I, we didn't meet, but I don't think you're there either. The second speaker is Simon Modeste, who is from the is from France, CNRS in Montpellier in France. And he's there live. I'm sorry I haven't met you, Simon, though we have interacted online. The third speaker is George Gadanidis from Western University, Ontario in Canada. Hello, George. We were lucky enough to meet you a few years ago. And the fourth speaker is Elena Prieto, from the School of Education, University of Newcastle in Australia. And it was wonderful to meet you a few years ago. So that's the panel, uh, slightly different orientations, certainly very different countries and jurisdictions. And so I hope that each um, speaker will speak for around about 10 minutes, try and show what's happening in their countries. We'll have a short pause before the next one for a few questions from anybody. Who or, uh, or comments who wants to make them from the I think mainly from the panelists to begin with and then we'll have some general discussion so we will start with on that uh, so hello there. it's good to see you I look forward to seeing you another time yes thank you for your introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to the organizing committee uh, may I share my slide Yes, please do. So uh, I will uh, talk about the coding in the Korean school curriculum um, and links with uh, mathematics. Uh, as uh, Celia Horse uh, introduced me, I'm Onam Gon. Uh, I'm professor of mathematics education at Seoul National University, uh, Korea. So I'm I'm gonna begin the, a bit of history of coding or uh, artificial intelligence education in Korea. So uh, we for the first time the coding is introduced was two thousand seven. The informatics, uh, that, that's the name of the school uh, subject. Uh, informatics, including coding in high school, that was two, 2007. And 2015, you know, uh, we introduced coding education at all school levels. 2016, uh, there was a real big event. Uh, Google DeepMind Challenge Match in 2016, on uh, February. AlphaGo versus hu human, uh, human Go player, Lee Sedol. That impacts Korean society everywhere. 
especially the AI education for the next generation has been a major issue in Korean society. In response to the social and political urge to prepare, to prepare a student for the future society, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, mathematics, was introduced to the national school curriculum for high school students in 2020. And last year, uh, we have uh, the MOE announced revised curriculum that is going to be implemented from 2025. New courses like uh, data science or software and, and life it will be teaching at the high school level. And also that uh, the MOE is announced that we are going to doubling the class time uh, previously, 2015 was uh, 17 hours. Now, you know, from 2025, like it's doubling 34 hours for uh, elementary uh, school. And on the, uh, the, the, we start uh, coding in pri uh, primary school grade six and block coding such as a scratch entries mentioned in policy uh, curriculum document. From middle schools, the codings are introduced not in mathematics, in informatics, but block coding uh, still is uh, mentioned in the uh, policy document. From high school, the codings, uh, coding is introduced in informatics and basic uh, artificial intelligence. But now the text coding such as uh, Python is uh, illustrated. This slide shows that the, on the left-hand side is curriculum. On the right-hand side is textbook at the primary uh, level at sixth grade. So here the achievement standard set like basic program process and students should design a simple program. Uh, and also the interpretation of achievement standard, it says that, that using block-based educational program tools are encouraged to use in, in schools. On the right-hand side is a textbook, one of the textbook based on the, this on uh, the uh, curriculum. So for instance, you know, programming on AG calculator using block coding is illustrated in the textbook. Informatics curriculum at the secondary level and from uh, middle school level, block coding, such as in programming, abstraction, algorithm programming, and block coding um, was mentioned, is mentioned. And in high schools and text coding, but there is a connection, there are connection between the informatics and mathematics uh, curriculum, such as data, algorithms, variable operations, and functions. And this slide is textbooks uh, based on previous the, the informatics uh, curriculum and block codings and, and text codings for high school. And program task, even though in informatics textbook, there is uh, many, uh, uh, some examples, program tasks related to mathematics, like multiplication table and drawing regular polygons, things like that. Uh, on the left-hand side is a uh, block coding because it's a middle school of textbook. On the right-hand side is a uh, text coding. Uh, not only in informatics uh, curriculum or textbooks, also um, in tasks related to coding in mathematics textbooks can be found. For instance, geometry. So under the, the uh, achievement standard, student should understand the property of polygons. That's uh, based on this achievement, uh, standard, some of textbooks have uh, this on the right-hand side as a uh, like draw a regular polygon using uh, a coding 
and explain why we rotate uh, by 120 degrees to make uh, an equilateral triangle. And in order to draw a regular polygon, tell what values should be entered here and here, input and explain why. This kind of uh, task is, is, is mentioned in the textbook. And algorithmic thinking task related to coding in mathematics textbook, especially in, in grade 11, uh, trigonometric functions. That's a high school textbook. And here, the fundamentals of generating algorithm for coding related to pseudo coding writing is introduced. And uh, I think I mentioned that in two, two, 2020, we introduced new subject, AI mathematics. So this is curriculum uh, document, part of the curriculum document, uh, AI mathematics, like uh, optimized, for instance, you know, categorization and prediction optimization. So here, uh, student should understand the mathematical method uh, of classifying image using artificial intelligence. That is one of the uh, achievement standard. Uh, but in this uh, uh, policy document, uh, like traditional mathematics concept is listed, but also the new mathematical concept related to the AI and coding is, uh, is, uh, is mentioned there. For instance, like loss function and gradient descent method. So this is textbook, uh, one of the textbook, uh, the AI mathematics optimization under the unit of optimization and uh, running a program that perform optimization process using gradient descent method through technological tools such as Google collaborate, uh, collaborators. So now I'm gonna show a short video uh, 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 a high school teacher who has experience in coding. Uh, he is going to talk about his reflection on geometry course and AI mathematics class. He is going to show two. One is his his explanation of geometry course, but AI uh, mathematics is one of the his real class. So, but that's an online course. So I'm gonna, let's watch. So this is teacher O Sejun on the on the bottom over there.
마음처럼 만들어지죠. 근데 또 마찬가지로 얘가 왜 끝이 안 보이는데 하면 결국 또40 이후로 50 이후로는 51, 52, 60, 6 0과 연결이 안 돼서 그러니까 아까 전에 했던 것처럼 나누쌤 블럭을 이용해서 50으로 나오는 나머지를 하시면 지금 n이 50이라서요. 이렇게 다 연결된 모습을 볼수 있습니다. 자, 이... Now uh, I, I, oh, oops, uh, I'll let conclude. So the coding in Korea is considered one of the digital competencies. So in a policy document. Um, and we are facing possibility to design new mathematical, mathematics curricula or new courses, which connect mathematics with other disciplines, such as AI and, and data science. Also, we are facing the challenges of teacher education for teaching new mathematical concepts or implementing mathematics classes from a new approach. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much uh, for a very stimulating um, uh, input and for sort of showing us not only the curriculum, but some amazing mathematics that's going on. I want to ask just one small question and then I want some somebody in the panel to ask another one and then we'll move on. But thank you very much indeed. And you fulfilled uh, your requirements very well. The, the question I want to ask is what is, how are your teachers trained to do this? This is a very sort of mundane question, but it's something that suddenly all our teachers, they will be trained to do, I don't know, teach maths or physics or whatever. And now they suddenly got to teach this new thing. How are your teachers trained? So MOE, Ministry of Education, has a special uh, professional development who want to teach AI, artificial intelligence and mathematics. So I think we have uh, about 60 hours of teacher training program. Mm -hmm. So these are teachers who are already in practice and they give an extra training. Is that yes. Right? Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Is there anybody, one of the other panelists want to ask uh, a question or would you, or not, or any, there's a horrible silence as far as I can tell. Anna, is there a silence over there? <laughs> I think in that case, probably I'll go to the next panel. Thank you very, very much, but do stay with us and you're going to have lots of questions, no doubt, later. Could I have the next presentation from Simon Modest, please, from Montpellier in France. Is that all right? Hello? I can't hear. Could we have the next presentation, please? Okay, yes, we, we couldn't unmute ourselves for 10 years now. Yeah, yes, wonderful. Thank goodness for that. This is the sort of thing that gives me a nervous breakdown that suddenly it all goes quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to take a minute before we um, pivot over to our in person participants, um, panelists, and um, you have a an issue with the audio flow. So, um,
Test one, two. Can everyone in the call hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes, that's much better. Okay, perfect. All sorted. Um, just one more. Sorry about that. Are we all set? We will be just one moment. Yeah, first I'm, I'm loading like, everything okay. up. Yeah. I'm getting feedback from somewhere. Test. No problem. Is that quicker? Okay. But it's in that. I mean, no, okay, I, I will take it. So, to, just to know who will do. Yeah, the I thought I was video. doing it. Or I, or I will. Okay. So, are we sharing the screen? Yes. Okay, very good. So, we are back. Thank you for your patience. So, um, Celia, do you want to introduce Simon? Or should I do it? No, you, no, you do it, Anna. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, his eyes, you know how much he wants you want to say. <laughs> okay. So, um, it's my pleasure to now introduce our first, uh, our second panelist, um, Simon Modest from the Université de Montpellier in France. So, please start. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is it working? Yes, it seems. Um, I will now present an example from France uh, of coding in mathematics in middle school uh, in grade nine. So just to situate uh, things, this is a synthesis of the current curricular situation in France concerning mathematics and computer science. In primary school, uh, CS, computer science, has been introduced as a subject since uh, 2015. Uh, and just to be clear, in France, we have just one teacher uh, for all the subjects at primary school. Uh, in middle school, CS has been introduced inside two subjects, technology and mathematics. And in mathematics, it's in a specific theme called algorithmics and programming, and the programming language is Scratch. In high school, computer science is now an independent subject with specific dedicated teachers, but mathematics kept the specific theme algorithmics and programming that, are, that was previously uh, introduced. So I think it's something interesting to, to notice. Uh, Python is the used programming language in, in the in the part of mathematics. So although we, we have this uh, ambitious uh, curriculum regarding programming and coding, uh, there are important differences between prescribed, implemented, and attained curriculum. Uh, the implementation of uh, curricula uh, depends on many things. The reality of the material and temporal context of teaching, the variety of the experiences of teacher with coding, and the weak in-service teacher education developed for CS in France, and the balance that is needed to make between mathematics and computer science contents. In practice, we can observe heterogeneity in teachers' practices, included 
including not teaching coding at all for some of them, uh, difficulties to attain the objective of this curriculum, and important heterogeneity in coding skills of students at the end of their scholarship due to uh, most of these uh, facts. So now let's focus on middle school mathematics. This is the theme among five describing algorithmics and programming in the math curriculum. I just want to mention the highlighted parts. Uh, at this level, students are introduced to programming by developing few simple programs in a project-based approach. Some examples of possible activities are presented in the curriculum. And they, if you look, they are all games or things like, that look like games. Uh, and the final expectation for the end of the middle school is to be able to write, develop, and execute a simple program, which is really, really general and fuzzy, but this is how it's formulated. So let's present the, the, the example that I will show in video. Uh, we are in the class of Damien, a mathematics teacher, former engineer, with a background in programming and computer science. In his course, he put a specific focus on learning coding independently of mathematics and based on video games design. He has access to a computer room, picture here, uh, where there are not enough computers for his ninth grade class, and he has no slots with half groups. So he separates the class into two groups, one working in autonomy on math exercises in the center of the room, and the other group working in autonomy with the pre, uh, with prefilled scratch project files. So uh, his sequence is organized uh, in six activities planned in three or four courses, uh, plus some work, with the goal of making a video game as a final project for students. The, the, the video you are going to see concerned activity, concerns activity two, making a car move using the keyboard. This, uh, this activity has three steps, making the car move with keys, which is already done at the moment of the video. It is expected to do that with an infinite loop, uh, as in the example here. Uh, so this infinite, infinite, infinite loop test if one of the key is pressed, and if it is, it moves a bit the car in the good direction. Then it is asked to control the speed of the car because it depends, of the it depends on the processor of the computer, the, 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 the speed of the car, and you want it to control it, to have it at 200 uh, pixels per second. This is the, the next step of the task. And finally, to make the car accelerate to 400 pixels per second when the D key is pressed. So this is the, the, the task. So this is the video. I, I have to say that it is with cuts and long moments where students are a bit lost, but I, I have shortened the video for, uh, for this, uh, this panel. Uh, and you will see two girls uh, working on the, on, the, on the project and some interventions of Damien, the teacher. So la now let's see the, the video. Are you seeing it now? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Ah non, c'est 
Maintenant, on va essayer de faire comme au cinéma. On va essayer de faire du image par image. D'accord Donc ça, après, il faudrait écrire... Euh, je ne l'ai pas fait ici, mais euh, V égale D sur T. Hein, on, est, on est dans cette configuration-là, hein, c'est l'ENA. La, la boucle infinie, c'est ce que j'expliquais tout à l'heure. Et après, si je veux gérer euh, ma vitesse correctement, ici, vous voyez, par exemple, si je veux faire du 100 pixels par seconde, c'est l'exemple que je peux donner. Euh, donc si je fais... En une seconde, je dois faire 100 pixels. Si je fais 10 images, ben je divise tout par 10. C'est la façon la plus simple d'expliquer, il me semble. Donc, ça veut dire si je divise tout par 10, ben je fais un dixième de la distance pour une seconde en un dixième de seconde. Si la touche est, si la touche est pressée. Ah. Alors attends. Ah mais du coup je peux mettre non. ça et je peux mettre. Eh oui 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 mais c'est ça en fait. Non mais ça là il fallait le mettre à la place d'indice là. Tu vois tu enlèves ton indice et tu mets. Alors nous, nous alors, la vitesse. Alors attends. Mais pour tous, bien sûr, ah, puisque... Ah, ah, tu ah, ah, ce que je peux ça. aller euh, du petit ah. Tu vois Si, bien sûr. Alors... Ah, mais du coup, après, pour la toucher, on verra Ah, bah, pour la toucher, on verra ça après. Nous faisons les choses une par une. Là, on a un petit peu de Alors, c'est tout bon. Il manque plus que gérer la vitesse. Là, on s'en va le double. Ah oui, tu as fait le double. Ah, j'ai fait le double. Mais non. Alors, attends. Si vitesse, mettre vitesse à 400, ajouter... Ah non, c'est pas bon. Si, regardez. Mais juste, mais juste, mais juste, mettre la vitesse à 400. Non, ça va pas. Non, attends. En fait, c'est pas comme ça qu'il faut faire. Ce qu'il faut faire, c'est... Oui, tu rajoutes si. Si la touche D est pressée, alors tu vas mettre vitesse à 400. Mais il faut mettre un signe. Je voudrais expliquer. Si là, tu fais ça, ça avance, ça, la vitesse. Et si j'appuie sur D, et là, ça va plus vite. Ben voilà. Et c'est parce que, en fait, là, une fois que tu l'as fait, une fois qu'il a mis à 400, il reste à 400 tout le temps. Tu vois Et là, c'est pour ça qu'il faut mettre 6D et PC 400. Sinon, tu mets 200. Well, I hope you appreciate the, the, the taste of the real <laughs> case of teaching and real problems when teaching uh, coding. Um, can we put the last yeah. frame? The, or the, oh, okay, it's yeah. a, sorry. Uh, no, can, can, no. can the people online see the slides again? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Just a concluding frame that will arrive, so I will start without this frame. As a conclusion, I'd like, no, it's in a different way. Okay. As a conclusion, I'd like to uh, share some observation from by that video that could stimulate our discussion. Uh, first about syntax and semantics. Um, 
we see the important role of uh, retroactions from the software in coding, but also the risk of uh, purely syntactic work from the students. We we'll really see that when they try just to copy what is on the whiteboard and just put the, all, the, all the pieces uh, together and try to produce what does the what looks like what is expected about what we call the didactical contract it seems that Simone, it's it just it's just yeah this is the correct side right? yeah. is yeah. it not where the thing is here oh, oh that's okay. what you're back oh. <laughs> okay yes. thank you that's just it right here i'll put, put it on there okay. you go <laughs> fantastic okay sorry uh, so about what we call the didactical contract, um, it seems that it is not clear for these students what is exactly expected. Is it a formal code or a solution to a problem that they have to resolve? And we see also the important role of the teacher in this, uh, in this small video and its interactions. And finally, about mathematics and coding, we have here an example of mathematics appearing in and for coding, making the, the car move at the good speed, which differs from coding for mathematics. It's another type of activity. But we can observe the difficulty for students to leave the computer, to go back to paper and pencil work and think about what they need to solve mathematically for their coding problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I thought that was really brilliant. And thank you so much for showing us a little bit of your classroom as well. I must say, when I saw the picture of the classroom with the, the uh, computers all around the desk looking so static, it looked pretty miserable to me, but I think the presentation was brilliant. I'm a bit worried about time, Anna. Do we have time for a question here? We've got some really good questions in the chat, or should we go on? I, th I think maybe we should go on and leave the, the questions till the end. Okay. Yeah. Can we have the next speaker? Please, George, over to you. Anna, would you introduce George? Yes, well, um, it's my pleasure to introduce George Cadenadis from Western University, did I remember that correctly, here in Canada. Thank you, Anna. I'll just wait for the slides to go up. There we go. So those of you uh, who can see the slides, there's a URL in the top left, and that will take you to the slides as well, and all the links will be live if you want to access them. The bit.ly URL in the blue. Yeah, in the blue, yeah. top left. So it's bit.ly and then Brock in capitals 29. All right, so I'm going to share, um, so my talk is uh, called Lessons Learned from Mathematics Plus Coding Classrooms. And I'll share some of the activities we've done in classrooms um, and the context immaculately described and everyone else has kind of chipped in and uh, said that Ontario curriculum has changed. So one to nine, we're doing mathematics and coding uh, as part of the curriculum. And in this context, there are a lot of teachers who have, don't have yeah. any experience. Could, could you hold on? Um, I think we lost the Zoom connection. Lost one. Celia, are you still there? No, I'm fine. I'm, I, oh, I thought I had a sign back. that said Zoom quit. Okay, good. It, it did, but it came back instantly. God knows okay, why. Great, great. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, go on. Sorry, George. Okay, no problem. So, um, so a lot of teachers have to implement this curriculum, but don't have any background in computer programming. And uh, so uh, the activities I'm going to share with you are introductory activities that try to connect coding expectations in the curriculum with mathematics expectations. So let me see if I can click. The other way. Oh, it's, it's upside down. Liking it, not liking it. I, we can we skip this one. These are some of the expectations. Okay, so the first activity, this comes from grades three and four. So in grade three, um, students are learning about variables in grade two as well, in grade three and four, and they're also learning about um, repeating patterns and also growing and shrinking patterns. At the same time, um, in the coding expectations are repeating patterns and also 
nested events. So you could have a repeat loop within another loop. So what we did in, for this case is we first um, modeled how we would draw a square. So a square is easy because you're repeating something over and over, you know, forward 100, turn right, forward, and then repeat that four times and you get a square. So then the puzzle was, let's look at a spiral. So we, I won't, I won't tell you what we did in the classroom just to speed it up here, but because there isn't time. But um, so the puzzle was, how do you do this? Because how do you repeat something that changes? So this, well, you could write long code without the repeat and get it to work. So, so the way we approach this then is not to try to get an answer or try to teach children how to code, but to give them this code. So what we do is we give them this code and say, I found this code. It seems to do what we want to do. Can you give it a try? So run the code, notice what it does, change some of the numbers, see what happens. If the code breaks, just reload the page. They'll come back and you can try again. And we also give them some puzzles. So the initial, the initial spiral goes outward. Can you make it go inward? Uh, can you make it so it's not a square, maybe a hexagon or a triangle? So that's what children are playing with. And, and, the, and, the, and the task of the teacher is not to explain. Let students explain among themselves. So the question is answered by a question. And the learning is supposed to be incidental. The next example. So this one uh, in grades five and six, uh, students are learning about inequalities. So Typically, what you would do with inequalities is you would have, let's say, 2x is bigger than 6. What could x be? And you might plot it on a number line, dot, 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 with an arrow. So in this case, we would start by not even saying much, but say, I found this, and it seems to be doing something interesting. Can you give it a try? So I did this during the pandemic uh, online with um, different groups of classes. It would be two or three classes, grades six to, seven, grade, grade six to eight. And it worked quite nicely because you start with a focused question. Everyone has the same question. You can't break it. You can always reload it. And the tasks are all the same and uh, work quite nicely. So then you can pose puzzles about, um, can you make it do this? Can you make it do that? The other thing we do, uh, in addition to that, if you're in a classroom, and usually second, if we can go to the next slide, is we put a number line on the floor and we talk about what's what, where are we on the number line uh, with um, x is bigger than five, let's say, and then we put another number line at right angles to that one, and then we say, well, okay, so that was easy, but where are we now on the floor? How do I know where I am? So we need two coordinates, and, and then if you are bigger than five, where would you be? And now you're either putting dots or you're painting the floor, depending on what your domain is, yeah? And we also then put a number line with string to the ceiling in the center. So we're doing that so that when students walk in the classroom, they have a sense of the space or the surface or the line under their feet or all around them. So they can be potentially be thinking about it and we can also keep referring to it. And you can use Python as well if you wanted to, uh, to model in this case, not necessarily for children to, to draw, um, to, to code, but um, you can represent the three dimensions. So that's a quick glimpse of that. Um, I didn't start my clock, so I'm not sure where I am. See, the, uh, so the third example comes from grade nine. And in grade nine, um, students are in the expectations. They have to learn the learning about infinity, limit, and density. So we're trying to group those together. So one way you can do that is by looking at uh, natural density. So imagine you have a, a box with all the natural numbers in front of you, and you pick and random, randomly pick out a, a natural number, and you say, What's the chance that it's going to be odd? So, and, and uh, well, half of the numbers are odd, so we can calculate that easily, theoretically. And it's, so the, the density of the odd numbers is 0.5. The density of the uh, of multiples of five, every five, so decimal two. What about the density of the number one? Okay, it's very hard to get it because there's so many in there, but it's still there. So one way to look at that is to look at, um, you know, in the first 10 natural numbers, the chance is one out of 10, the first 100 is one out of 100, one out of 1,000, one out of a million. So it's one 
the, the numerator doesn't change, but the denominator goes to infinity. So it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so, um, and what, but what about square numbers? So square numbers, they're an infinite set within an infinite set. So what, what, what is the density of the square numbers? What's the probability of reaching in to my box and picking out a square number? Well, if you look at the first 10, there's three of them in there. So it's gonna be decimal three. In the first 100, there's 10 of them. So it's gonna be decimal one. And if you keep going like this, you get the same pattern as the one, but it's, it, it, it reduces more slowly. If you wanna do it algebraically, it's uh, in the first X odd numbers, uh, there is root X square numbers. So it's root X over X, simplify one over root X. So the numerator is one, the denominator goes to infinity. So um, that's another way of looking at it. So, okay, so what do you do with this? So what you can do with this is uh, you can, if you scroll, please, uh, let's see where we are, scroll again. So you could do a table of values. So you could do a table of values, you can look at different intervals. So you can start counting, let's say the, the square numbers in each one of those, you can find them. So you know, I wouldn't tell them initially that you take the square root to find them, um, how many there are, but just find them in there and, um, and then calculate and see what's happening. So um, to make a long story short, what you could do also is write some code. So in this case, again, if you go scroll, I think you'll see some code. Um, and this one, this one does it by checking whether it's a square number. So we're checking all the numbers. So it's a, it's a kind of brute force method. It doesn't use algebra to, to, to get you the, um, and what it does is it considers intervals, like the first 10, the first 100, the first and so on. So it's, it's one way to start uh, using programming in the grade nine classroom by giving students code like this. What does it do? How does it do it? How is it similar to what we did with the tables? How is it different? And so on. And, um, and then how do you how do you make it more efficient? How do you change it? Now that we've done some algebra as well, because if you're doing exponents in grade nine, you can possibly do some of the algebra involved with that. How do we change it? So there's opportunities to, to, to build on this. Um, next slide. And you can also use Python and, and um, you can model this graphically as well. So you can see what's happening with the patterns. And next slide, please. Okay, so, um, so well, in Ontario, we have this now integrated in the curriculum is mandatory for more than 1.5 million students. So potentially, if everyone's doing it, it's, kind of, you know, to some degree, locally, you know, literacy, right? Could be. Um, so uh, reading um, Andy's work, Andy DeSessa, who's here with us, um, he talks about literacy is revitalizing mathematics. Now, one thing that Andy talks about that um, as well that he didn't talk about in his talk is the, uh, the principles or you may call affordances of literacies. So four R's, remediation, uh, reformulation, reorganization, and revitalization. So those four R's, um, we find them very useful in analyzing the potential of tasks not only looking at them, the beauty of it is that, I mean, it's, it has a high floor, a high ceiling, right? Because you're talking about literacy, changing everything around us. And on the other hand, those four categories are very useful to also analyze tasks we find. Where they're completely useless is if it's shallow mathematics, which that's what makes it beautiful because um, you don't want a, a model that's going to give you analysis of something that is not worth doing. So it's only applicable if you're doing something that's rich enough. So the, you need deep mathematics to use it. So, um, and our goal and and um, we try to, um, so we had some graduate students involved in this. Um, Aaron Clements from McMaster University did her thesis by uh, using uh, Andy's um, work and um, she and uh, also Miroslav Lovrek who's here they changed the program so it's integrated mathematics and python coding for a thousand students or more in, in first year calculus and then they use Andy's principles to analyze it um more, more recently we did also some work in looking at some tasks ricardo 
Cucuglio is here, Immaculate Namukasa, and, um, and Stephen uh, Floyd, who's here as well. So we, we put a paper out on that as well. And um, so, and just to wrap it up, um, I think um, there's potential here. Um, I mean, if, if I'm going to be a downer about this, I mean, historically, things don't change. I think, um, uh, I think Brent Davis mentioned that, you know, we, historically, if you look at cooperative learning, manipulative concrete materials, coding, vertical whiteboards, you name it, um, the common comment you get from leaders visiting classrooms is it looks great, but there's no math happening or it hasn't changed. So you're doing the same math on vertical whiteboards as, as you were doing before, but now students are standing up and coding. It looks really fun, but I don't see any math happening here. So you get comments like that. So it's hard to make it to, to have change, but um, I think it's worth trying. The other thing is that I think uh, our, when we work with teachers, this is the last thing I'll say, is our goal is not to try to change all of their, all of their work. It doesn't work to try to do that anyway, but to uh, give them opportunities to try something once every unit. So offer a menu, something here look, from, look promising, try that one and do the best you can with it. But at the same time, whatever you're doing is matching coding with mathematics, but in a way that it models mathematics concepts that are worth talking about, something that's worth doing something that's conceptually rich that shows us some of the structure of mathematics. Thank you, George. Thank you, that was brilliant. Anna, I think we should go straight on to the next one. I'm worried about- Okay, and- um, Absolutely brilliant. Last, later. Yes, last but not least, um, we have Elena Prieto from Newcastle University in Australia. She came all the way from Australia. So. Yeah, and uh, I had prepared a video, so maybe we'll start with that and then. Oh, okay, so we'll start with Elena's video. Can you see the video, those online? Yes. We Yes, we have okay. a wonderful picture of Elena. Yeah, it's I'm... not running yet, which is one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, ah. my name is Elena Prieto, and I am an associate professor in mathematics education at the University of Newcastle in Australia. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the situation is in terms of education in computational thinking, coding, and mathematics uh, in New South Wales, which is the state where I live in Australia. So, a little bit of history first. In September 2015, the National Australian Curriculum was officially endorsed. This curriculum includes the new digital technology subject within the technologies learning area, which is focused on um, the teaching of, and I quote, computational thinking and information systems to define, design, and implement digital solutions. This document stated that these subjects was to be mandatory for all Australian students from kindergarten to year eight. Year eight is uh, approximately 14 years of age. And then it was going to be an elective for year nine and 10 students. However, the landscape of Australian schooling is decentralized and the technologies curriculum in New South Wales, which is the most popular state in Australia, uh, appears within the science and technology syllabus. So not within technologies, but within science. Mm. Interesting, neither of these syllabi, neither the Australian one nor the New South Wales ones, um, incorporate computational thinking within mathematics. They are separate subjects, either within technologies or science. And um, even though computational thinking is very closely tied to mathematical thinking, as we know from a lot of them, research over the past few decades. Um, additionally, another thing that is interesting about the implementation of, uh, of digital technologies in Australia is that very few people, particularly in the primary school settings, uh, which is where the bulk of this curriculum was to be delivered, have had any formal schooling in computational thinking or coding. And uh, they are really um, serious concerns with the where we still are, I suppose that um, these teachers possessed the pedagogies uh, to teach coding and computational thinking authentically. So to facilitate 
incorporating the skills and content, the New South Wales Education Standard Authority, which we normally refer to as NESA, prepared um, a guide called the Coding and Computational Thinking Across the Curriculum Guide for Teachers, which aimed to develop algorithmic and computational thinking skills to better enable students and teachers to uh, reach a coding goal. The guide highlighted areas where computational thinking can be applied within the existing K-8 um, uh, syllabuses and uh, contained activities uh, and links to resources organized by stages of learning and learning areas. It was a very comprehensive um, guide. Uh, how, you know, right now uh, it's been discontinued and it's actually, it cannot be found on NESA's website. And um, there's new priorities in the syllabus which focus on other things like, um, you know, uh, Australia's uh, engagement with Asia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' priorities and sustainability, all very worthwhile um, focus areas, but it seems that code and computational thinking has disappeared from, from being a focus of learning in New South Wales. So in this climate, my work has focused on the integration of coding and computational thinking into the mathematics curriculum. In particular, over the past few years, I've been working with Cecilia Hoyles and Richard Notes on the implementation in Australia of Scratch Maths. Scratch Maths, as you may know, is a two-year computing mathematics um, syllabus based on um, Key Stage 2 in the UK, which is equivalent to our years four and five here in Australia. So for this Australian implementation, we conducted professional development with teachers for roughly eight weeks, commencing with a two-day professional development workshop and ending with the final showcase where the teachers um, came to the university and shared their experiences and samples of a student's work. We also offered support during the interim classroom implementation period. The aim of the project was to explore participants' teachers' perceptions of their ability to facilitate students' learning processes, to develop mathematical ideas through coding, and how those perceptions change after the eight weeks of professional learning. Uh, the project was one of the most successful ones that I have run. Teachers loved the materials, gained confidence in teaching and coding, statistically significant, um, I must say, uh, confidence in teaching coding and also learned coding. Uh, so we had a, a way of, of testing how they were before and after and we saw a massive improvement on the type of things that they were able to, to do with, um, with Scratch. Uh, furthermore, the students also showed significant improvement in their learning of coding and computational thinking and also um, in their enjoyment of mathematics. So uh, this research formed the base of one of my PhD students' thesis, which was also a very successful project that extended these, and um, also has meant that uh, he's now working with the New South Wales Department of Education as a researcher. So um, there you have a little bit of history about um, how coding and computational thinking is taught in Australia, and also um, the possibilities that are open when uh, teachers learn and receive professional development and, and the benefits that that has for their students. Thanks a lot for listening. Do you wanna say anything else, Elena? Uh, perhaps just mention that uh, all of this um, policy landscape that I was talking about is immersed within a massive mathematics uh, teacher shortage and technology uh, teacher shortage. So we've got about 60% of children that are in classrooms in New South Wales that are not being taught by someone who was trained in teaching mathematics. Similarly with technology, most children that are a part of this digital technologies curriculum within the technology subject, um, they are taught um, coding by metal and timber teachers or um, food technology teachers because uh, technology encompasses all these and there's a lot more food tech teachers than there is coding teachers. So for the most part, they are never taught by someone who knows how to code. So quite often when you walk into classrooms and I've done a bit of this, what you encounter is 
children teaching children and children teaching teacher. And that's great. But I think it's, it's important to mention that this is the landscape at present. Obviously not in every classroom, but for the most part. Thank you, Elena. Um, now, um, Celia, do you want us to? Um, I, I thought it was really good. Thank you very much, Elena. And I, I don't know, I feel very depressed now. <laughs> I believe it's all just come and gone so quickly because when Richard and I were there with you, it was just all beginning and it was all very exciting. Now you'll say it's sort of, the book, even the books have gone. Uh, I must say there was a huge move to say people do on unplugged activities. And I must say most of the computing in my country is done unplugged. So I've got a little campaign going. It would be really quite nice if the students actually tried a bit, but that's another bit. I now want to go on to Richard quickly. Richard, sorry, you're going to do your reaction and I will yes. shut up now. Okay, <laughs> then me... you introduce him. Yes, I'm going to introduce <laughs> Professor Richard Noss. Yes, yes, we're ahead of time. So Celia, um, maybe we can have some questions to the panelists before we introduce Richard. Oh, okay, fine. Yes. I was, I was panicking in terms of- Yeah, we still have four, 45, 45 minutes oh, right. before okay. Richard's reaction. Oh, wonderful. Absolutely yes. wonderful. I don't know, so I've seemed to have lost half an hour. It must be in the uh, the time to go from Canada. Yes. To I, was, I was a bit surprised when you- <laughs> Sorry, there you go. So we have time for, for discussion among the panelists and if there are questions from the audience as well. Oh, Andy Di Sessa has a question. Okay, uh, thanks so much. Great presentation, uh, uh, very provocative all the way around. Uh, I had a question for Simone. Um, I saw very familiar things in that video. I saw of, of a certain style of instruction, the students trying, failing, working together, sometimes successfully, interacting with the teacher, uh, uh, copying, copying work from the teacher and for other for other students. So, so the question is, do you view view it that way? Uh, uh, is is this just a generic teaching of a certain sort? Possibly, it's different because that's not common in France. That the idea of giving students a project—I I just don't know what's the what's the ordinary mode. So I'm trying to trying to understand what's just generic, you know, issues in teaching of a of a certain general type, pro problem based, uh, and and what is what is specific to the computational side of it. That's a lot of questions. I will try to be brief uh, about the genericity of what you've seen. Um, I'd say that it's ordinary in the sense that it is not a specific place where uh, where were uh, gifted children or uh, poor children at the contrary with very uh, very uh, few resources from their family about coding it's let's say it's a, an average uh, uh, place. And it's not something with intervention of researcher or something like that. In, in that way, it's ordinary. I just contact teachers and ask, can I take videos in your class? And I went. So it, it was ordinary in, in the sense that if I were not there, it would have been the same. Um, but it's, you, you, your, your question is really interesting because the teacher has a background as an engineer and as a background in computer science. So he has ideas of what is this discipline, what is expected, what are the big concepts and notions that should be taught or learned. So it's not an average teacher in that way. The way he teach is really Classical, I think, if you go to other classes in France, you will see the same thing when computer science is taught. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, yes, the, 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 the curriculum asks to 
make small projects to to make things that are directed in learning computing coding computer science and not only mathematics using computer science or developing computational thinking while doing mathematics so he has this, this point of view that it you it takes time to make something which is teaching computer science and sometimes math arrives as you can see with the the, the speed issue um, but in many classes you will find things that are closer to make math make write programs produce produce codes that implement mathematics ideas maybe closer to the the spirals you've seen or designing polygons and things like that so most you you will see maybe most of the time things that are more linked to applying coding to uh, mathematics contents because it's there where ma uh, mathematics teacher are uh, co co comfortable So now, now we have a question online. Yeah, uh, actually, we have two questions uh, from our uh, online uh, audience. One is uh, for the panelists um, from Howard. Is the expectation that uh, all students come up with the correct uh, algorithm? Or is originality and elegance encouraged as long as the functionality is achieved? Uh, in other words, is coding considered to be a creative uh, creative exercise with constraints, much like writing poetry with an objective rather than a static test? That's a long question. Uh, and there's another question for George. So let's let's do this one first. Yes. Do I need to repeat the question? No. Um... <laughs> I think it depends on who's teaching it, the answer to that question. So for some people, uh, particularly if the teacher themselves are not that proficient with coding themselves, what they want to see, and it happens with maths, they want to see the right answer. So they want to see an algorithm that looks exactly like the one in the you know, back of the textbook, or in this case, the, the, you know, the solution that they've got. If the teacher is more confident and can see possible solutions to the same it becomes something a little bit more creative and then teachers can start talking about efficiency of algorithms and you know but for to be able to talk about efficiency of an algorithm you have to know that some algorithms are more efficient than others right and you mentioned oh this is a brute force algorithm in in your video most teachers would not have the faintest idea of um you know that that is a brute force algorithm versus versus something that is um, you know, more sophisticated. So it really depends. That's my experience. Any different experiences? <laughs> yeah, maybe question for George. Yeah. Um, Onam and uh, Celia, do you want to respond to that before the next question? I want to hear George's answer to that question and also to the other one that's on the chat here. How wild and bizarre are the students' explorations? Okay, I'll read that because they don't get yes, to You do it, you read it. I just like okay. to it. So a question for George. Uh, how wild and bizarre are the students' expectation, uh, explorations and how often do the experiments relate to more a more general concept and how are these insights shared throughout the class? Sorry, let me catch all of that, I'm sorry. Did okay, how wild that? and bizarre are the students' explorations? That's yeah. one. And how often do they, do their experiments relate to a more general concept and how these insights shared throughout the class? So, um, well, I wish you were here so I could ask a bit more about those, but let me, let me give it a crack and see if I'm on the right track. So, um, so wild, how wild are their explorations? So, um, so one thing that you find, so let's, let's look at young students. Let's say grade three, four, two. 
So when we do coding in that, those classrooms, um, what typically happens is not only do students learn what we're talking, what we're doing, like in that, but they're also then. So th th this is in classrooms where coding was happening for the first time. So I was in there co-teaching, and now they're picking up code, they're learning on their own, and they're putting sounds in. Um, they're changing the sprites. They're doing all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect. They're changing the size of the of the lines. So now becoming and the bigger the better. Like it fills fills the screen, and they're like, oh, how do I do it? So um, so they're naturally it's a it's a it's a great environment. Generally, uh, coding for them to play with. So they play. So and. And, and uh, what we learned is to, to give them some time to get that out of their system, you know, to just play and just try whatever, make sounds, whatever you want to do. And then we we'll refocus and say, okay, can we do with these tools and so on. The other one is um, so more general, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of sharing, um, it's, like, it's like wildfire. You know, when you're doing something um, in a classroom, and somebody solves something quick, very quickly, someone else sees it, and then it spreads, which is a nice way. The other way is that uh, we've done different things in classrooms to share. Generally students, um, so generally students are working in pairs, and they're encouraged to, to, it's not cheating to go and ask questions. It's, we're all working together. So you wanna go see what someone else is doing, go right ahead and come back, uh, or you wanna share something, go ahead and do that. But also we have we have ways of doing things so that we can collect um, students. So we collect we collect um, what students are saying and what they're doing, and then we share that back to them. So we share back to the whole class what the whole class knows as much as possible. So uh, there's very I won't go into that detail, but we want to raise everyone's knowledge to their class knowledge. So we create opportunities for them to see what everyone else is doing even if it didn't happen uh, all at once there. So maybe uh, that's enough of an answer for now. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions here? Okay. Um. I'd last to, like to ask them all a question too, please, all of the four, because um, one of the issues is equity issues. And uh, I'd really like to know if there are um, any equity issues that you have noticed in the implementation of the various curriculum? Because certainly it's a big issue here. Um, it's usually the same old people who are doing, doing the domination and doing it, you know, doing well. And for those of us who really like and is, you know, revitalizing, are we revitalizing and making it worse? Because now there's a digital divide as well as a mathematical divide. So I'd just like to know what your feelings about equity in using um, these, uh, well, all of you, just to say something very specifically about that, or if you don't know, then fair enough, but. Maybe just some, it's it's observation. I mean, it's not results or uh, date, solid data, but w what I've seen in France is that concerning uh, concerning from where you you come uh, and low incomes uh, families they they don't have computers at home but they have you know uh, ipads or things that are not uh, suitable for programming or less suitable for programming it's it's surprising that it's not that they have not access to technology but they have very i don't know how to say that consumer technology and not technical, scientific, um, adapted technology. And it's difficult to, to code on uh, an iPad or something like that. Whereas in wealthy families, I have observed that they have computers at home, let's say regular computers. So this is the first issue about equity. Another one that we have in France and is, which is strongly discussed is the access because of bias, the access for women to, um, to mathematics and uh, computer science careers. Yeah. And this is an issue about representation against uh, which we have to fight in schools, but it's not easy to, to tackle it. But it's, there, there is really a big issue about uh, 
gender uh, differences regarding the the interest or the feeling uh, feeling confident to to learn and go to computer science and mathematics um in um, australia for a couple of years we had something they called a digital education revolution and every child was given a computer um the dr computer it was called and by the time that the teachers started to catch up of all the things that you could do with this computer and it had like you know it had reasonable things installed in it it came all pre-packaged um it was abandoned <laughs> uh, so um that that, that's my story about equity. It could have been, it could have been a wonderful thing, but it just wasn't. I think the Department of Education started collecting data on how the computers were used. And uh, most children did not use the computer for the purposes that it was intended. I think that's why they stopped it. Um, in terms of equity, uh, one other slice of it would be that um, working in classrooms, initially, I, I would be asking, um, I'd be, I'd, I'm asked to look at this student or look at that student, look at him or look at her, and quickly learn that what the teacher is saying is I'm seeing something new here. Something's happening that I haven't seen before, the student normally doesn't seem like they understand, but now they're expressing themselves very clearly, or they're participating. <laughs> So um, something is changing. I don't think it's just coding. I think other uh, tools that we can bring in the classroom also change who engages and how. But I think coding is especially, I mean, I, I was listening to Stephen Floyd when we started our working group. And he said, he said something like, um, you know, coding classroom, just teaching computer science is very different than teaching other subjects. You know, it just feels different. And it, it does. It's like when you're when you're with a computer and your students come in and they're excited, they're in charge of this thing. And, you know, Papert and everyone else and Celia and uh, and Richard and someone have written about all this. Um, and um, so there's there's the, they have opportunity to be agents in in that environment. And and the, I guess our task, the the you know, the, the puzzle, the artistic puzzle we have to solve is how do you make that focus mathematically deep? Because they will engage no matter what you do. They'll find things to do and it's gonna look like they're doing great stuff. Yeah. You know? So how do you do that? So, and, and that varies, you know. Um, one thing I find that's also equity, uh, well, no, it's not, I'll stop there. I'll stop, that's enough, yeah. You need to go to Onan. Thank you, no, we have here, Oh, Onam wants to say something. Yes, Onam, do yes. you want to answer that? Please? Yes, uh, yes. In terms of the equity issues, uh, uh, we have a similar situation that friends. So we have a, a bit of, uh, you know, the teachers in computer science, uh, most men. So women teachers are under representative in the computer science. But uh, surprisingly enough, the math teachers, like uh, more than uh, and half a woman, even in high school. But computer science, we are really shortage of uh, women teachers. And the second issue is about uh, the equity is that as low income family do not have their uh, computers in their home. So MOE is trying to get uh, fix some budget for the, to, to give some kind of uh, technological tool like iPad to low-income family, uh, uh, children from the low-income family. Uh, so I think it's a similar to situation to friends in a way. But I have uh, some, here is some questions about- uh, Yes, um, Onam, um, mm -hmm. we, we need to start with Richard. So oh, okay, okay. We, we also have several questions. There was someone standing here waiting to ask a question and we, we have a few questions online. But if Richard is ready, uh, I would like to, uh, are you ready, Richard? I'm ready for whatever it brings. Okay. I, I have about three minutes, I think, do I? Yeah, let me, let me introduce more. you. Richard, you have more. Yes. Okay, so, well, 
Richard Noss is emeritus, and he's someone very dear to me because he was my PhD supervisor. So Richard Noss is emeritus professor of mathematics education at the UCL Institute of Education in the University College London in the United Kingdom. He holds a master's degree in pure mathematics, a PhD in mathematics education, and has taught mathematics at all levels of the education system. Richard has co-directed many research projects, such as the Playgrounds Project, the Web Labs Project. He was the founding director of the London Knowledge Lab, an interdisciplinary research facility at UCL, exploring the future of learning with digital technologies. He was the assistant director of the European Union's Kaleidoscope Network of Excellence for TEL, I don't know what that is, um, research, uh, across Europe and was a national director of the technology enhanced education learning program funded by the United Kingdom's research agencies. So Richard, it is, I'm so honored to have you here and, and please, um, it's, you have the, your, you can now start. First, I'm going to take the first minute of my three, just to thank Chantal and all her colleagues who worked so hard to get me here, even in virtual space, not real space. I have one or two things that have come up. But I must say that this has been one of the most interesting conferences of its type that I've ever been to. There's something that's happening, which I don't know if it's worldwide or just this group, but what's happening is that I think people are putting into practice what we previously only had as theory. So here's an example. Um, Let's take George's example of those lovely tasks he gave the students. I think we're a long way down the line now from the days when we either people either said, is the computer good for learning? We kind of learned that it might be a better question to say, when is the computer good for learning? But now we really are beginning to take that for granted. My answer to, was it Howard's point, would be, you wouldn't ask that question from a math teacher, so why are you asking that question from a computer teacher? And I think when teachers start to grab some autonomy, we're really making progress. I, I think, I, I want to tell you a 60 second story, and probably I'll have to finish there. Um, about 40 years ago, the four color theorem was proved. This is a theorem that simply says, if you have a map, you only need four colors to make sure that none of the boundaries touch each other of the same color. Um, it took 150 years to prove, so it's not trivial. And <laughs> I was a student at the time. Uh, and I think the thing that was most impressive to me is that it really began a conversation between all the different kinds of mathematicians some of whom said, this can't be a real proof because it uses a computer. And it was the first computer assisted proof. By the way, we never had computer assisted mass education, did we? We had computer based mass education. I leave that with you to see whether that's relevant or not. So with the four color theorem, it was very interesting. Some mathematicians said, I'm against using the computer in, uh, in any kind of mathematical proving. And some said, doesn't matter what you do, as long as it looks as if it's a true theorem. The difference was, the difference between now and then was that um, in the role that the computer was asked to play in the proof, uh, there was a, lo a, a lot of nuance, sorry, my voice is going, a lot of nuance involved. So some people were using the computer, like the four color theorem, simply a way of speeding up calculation. And so there were people doing what teachers were doing, I think 20 years ago, and say, this can't be really mathematics anymore. This is some kind of new subject. On the other hand, now 40 years after that proof was, was made, there are still debates going on, although of a much more sophisticated time, type. So I think we, just, you, uh, uh, maybe the whole community deserves a pat on the back. We've made some real progress. There's plenty of progress that we could make. I just wish I had more than three minutes. <laughs> I'll tell you what, 
two, why don't somebody ask two of the worst questions I've ever asked anybody and just see if we can run around the room with it. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Any comments? Um, should we go on to the questions that we had waiting? Yeah. Celia? Uh, actually, yeah. I mean, just to continue on Richard's four color thing. I mean, I think it's basically, I remember them saying the problem with that proof, the mathematician said, it gave no insight into how it was made. It was just, you know, big computation. And I think what all of us are involved in programming, we, we see that the program tells you how the thing's being constructed that you can then share and discuss. And uh, I think I, that's exactly what mathematicians want to do. And I think that's why we, people mention that, you know, talk about structure, you can see what it's about. So I don't know. I must say this. I, I, We're I, in different rooms, by the way. <laughs> I must say, I don't think, I think that's true in, in terms of rhetoric, but I don't see mathematicians being at terrible pains to make it easy for other mathematicians to read their proofs. Yeah, but well maybe they need to start with our panelists' classrooms and then they'll realize the importance of showing their program about how they've done it and things like that. But I do, I do want to show, I've almost said this before, but I'm going to, I want my uh, questions from all the panelists, answers from all the panelists, all of them, and indeed Richard. I wrote a paper years ago called The Trojan Mouse. Um, it was quite a nice paper, actually, I think. But it was we had all this rhetoric about how computers were going to revolutionize and revitalize and everything. And then nothing happened. It all went up with a whimper. And uh, I have a worry that despite all the wonderful things you're talking about and the MICA project at Brock and all the innovation that Anna has done in in Mexico and the micro worlds that we've all built, is it going to end up with nothing? Um, and I I remember the, everybody, when we did scratch maths, where we said, well, it's important to have these unplugged activities. So you go away and you reflect. And now it's all unplugged, as I've said. And I just thought, is there anything we can do to safeguard this from happening <laughs> at all? And maybe all the programming is done at home or in clubs. Um, so I just want everybody on the panel and Richard to give us something. This is going to really um, change what mathematics is out like for most kids, because that's what we all really want. And I'm going to ask you all to say something about that. Oh. Anna, you can start. <laughs> Why? <laughs> What, what do you want me to say? Oh, I just want everyone to say something about, because Richard said there's something feeling different about this, and I hope he's right, but are we going to make sure this really does um, really change what's happening in the culture of school maths? We have, uh, actually, somebody was talking about gender and computer science. The figures in this country, in England, about gender and computer science are terrible, are terrible in terms of it's all men, uh, it's completely dominated by by males and privileged males at that. So I, I want really people to say that it's going to be best this time. Yeah. So so maybe I'm not the best one to do it because I've become very cynical and I feel- oh, No, no, Anna. There are social and political forces that tend to block our way. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's more what, it's beyond our control in, in a way. I mean, we can do pro proposals and hopefully some of them will be picked up and, and continued because that's a big problem. It's beautiful things that we've all done across the world and that have sadly been stopped by politicians or just social forces of other kinds. And um, so I've become very cynical, <laughs> sorry. So I don't know if anyone, yes. I, uh, I think that uh, in the climate of high stakes testing and uh, assessment, we cannot change the way we teach things. If children are gonna be assessed in, you know, 
45 minute time slots where they have to solve a problem and give the right solution. If that is the only way that we can think of assessing children, and if we want to have uh, testing that covers entire countries so that everyone is tested and that your entry to your next level of education, um, you know, being within secondary or university is dependent on that, we cannot change the way mathematics is taught if everybody has to have an exam in year 12 to get to university that has to be done pen and paper in one hour. Because that's not the way we think of mathematics learning. Any good mathematics that was ever produced was never done in an hour. You know, sometimes it took 150 years. So unless we change the paradigm of assessment, I don't think we're going anywhere. But that's, again, my cynical, pessimistic way. Things are happening in classrooms for sure. Yeah. And Celia, can I make one comment on Anna's point? Go on then. Uh, chat, B, chat GBT just scored 95% on A-level university entry mathematics. 95%. Something's going to change, Anna. Yes, and, and, and if I want to be more optimistic, you know, that we are planting seeds and the, the children that go through all these programs of you know le learning code they when they get older i mean things things may change because they actually went through these um changes themselves as as children so maybe in 20 years we'll see a very radical change as, as you say we also have chat G gtp so i was telling yesterday that we had this um this plenary on ai and facial recognition and I, I, we, afterwards, we were, I was talking, it's so important because we now have artificial intelligence to develop think, critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. So learning, learning to learn, learning to think rather than using, um, you know, depending on technology. So that is what Seymour wanted, is to create learners, right? And, and critical learners and learners who could understand think about their own learning and that's what this whole ai revolution will bring is that we will have to have more critical thinkers and my other positive note because i felt very bad about being so negative is that the program here at brock is one example of something that is sort of magnificent that has continued for 20 years and i'm sure the people who went through that program are also planting seeds of change elsewhere. So yeah. that's a Mr. Optimist in two minutes. Very good. <laughs> I think we should hear from the other panelists, please. Yes. Oh, Nam, do you want to say anything or Simone? Oh, Nam? And we have some questions waiting as well. Well, I'll make a comment. Um, so I think. I don't know that this is the answer, but I think I think we have an implementation issue. Um, I think in Ontario we have an excellent curriculum. Yeah, I, I love it. Uh, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's a great improvement on what we had before, and it does tie in, you know, a, a, a representation tool, uh, whatever you want to call it, to mathematics. And um, I think what we're doing is we're keep producing more and more and more resources at a low, low, low level. There's, we have a lot of materials that are created and we're all, there's just too much. So if I go on the ministry website, there's tons of stuff on there and there's other stuff coming from everywhere. So what I would do, if I was God of math world, um, <laughs> what I would do is I would say, I would, if I was the ministry of education and I've told them this, um, that I would create for every grade, a small set a small set of activities. I don't know, start with two or three if you want to and uh, require that everybody try them. So a small set, you do whatever else you want, whatever else you're doing is, you know, but we're not gonna change everything for you, but we're gonna do something. I think the challenge is that a lot of our students are sitting in classrooms and they're not paying attention because they've learned that mathematics is just not worth attending. So they're waiting for the answer or they're waiting for something. I think if we had a few activities that can turn them on, 
I think it can have a long lasting effect. I mean, I, I've, I've seen this with myself when I pick up a new piece of software and all of a sudden I can do something different with it. I'm, I'm, I, my mind changes, you know? So I don't think we have a tradition of mathematics of being able to talk about mathematics, to be able to share things that are exciting about mathematics. I think most people that work in mathematics don't really see value it in the sense of this is wonderful, this can create beauty, there's a beautiful structure or know the structure. We haven't learned all those things. So I think we need to start small and just show examples of it to everybody, but not try to do everything because we can't create enough good examples uh, right now. That would be my wish. Uh, yeah, just to, to maybe add a complimentary comment about that. Uh, I agree that maybe we have to help or uh, help teachers in order to uh, find their way in all these resources that they have. But I'm not sure that we have too much to tell them which are the good resources. And I think there is a lot to do in teacher training to make them able to do that work also because tons of resources will all, always be there and I'm, I, I have the feeling that it's something that in some uh, ideas of making teaching more professional there is an idea that teacher may, must be good executors of very very good curriculums or very very good politics or way of teaching and I'm pretty sure that this won't work. So if I, if I have to add something about that, it would be to take more time, more energy, more money, of course, in teacher training in order to make teacher more, um, more uh, autonomous and gain in uh, capacity of selecting good resources understanding what their students are doing. In, fr in France, there is this idea that the, the ministry try to just find good uh, activities for classroom and think that if we give the good resources to the teacher, it will work and not spend too much money in training teachers. And I think it's, this, won't, this won't work. So maybe we need to, let's say, empower and give uh, uh, and train uh, it give good education training is not maybe not the good work good education to teachers to be better teachers and more autonomous teachers thank you Sam. yes that's always the point isn't it teacher training is good do you want um he's been waiting for a while do you want to come and ask your question so we have Varun from India, now in Canada. <laughs> so I teach, I'm a mathematics teacher in Quebec. So yeah, so this question, thanks for sharing what's happening around the world in the CT or the, I would say coding classroom. Uh, I have never taught coding or computational thinking myself, but I think this question is coming to all the teachers who are uh, teaching that. And it's from the student, why do I need to learn this? Because in mathematics, whenever I start a new chapter, what is in there for me or why do I need to? So I tell them the applications or what all they can do with learning this topic. And that's really leads to student engagement. So when I'm gonna teach computational thinking or introduce coding into my lectures, then student might have this question and teachers must have uh, faced this question earlier that what is there for me? Are you making me a software engineer from the like grade three or grade four, like why I need to learn this. So maybe you, the, your teachers you have trained might have faced this question and what answer would they get? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, just why, why don't we ask the same question for mathematics? <laughs> oh, we should. <laughs> yes. But kids all the time ask that question, Simon. They say, why are we learning this? And they only ask that when they're bored. When they're involved, trying to solve a problem together, they don't ask that. Yeah, 
there's there's a couple of questions online. Let's see if I can see them here. Um, okay. Um, kids. Yeah, kids. Uh, Anna, yes, I yes, can. Yes, you're reading. You read them. There. Okay, good, good, good. Yes, so we do have some questions from our online audience. Uh, so the one there's three we missed. Uh, one from Pam. Uh, so she asks, how do we help teachers uh, or teacher candidates build the skills, uh, knowledge, and confidence to effectively teach both mathematics and computing? Any responses from the panelists? Yeah, so um, so when this movement started for uh, coding, um, um, you know, we were thinking everyone seemed to have forgotten what happened in the past. You know, it was all about learning how to code, but coding has a, has a history in education that, um, that is connected to mathematics and other subjects too, but mathematics specifically with the worker, Papert, Decessa, Boyles, Noss, and others. And so uh, what Immaculate and I did in our, Immaculate Namukasa and I, in our faculty of education, before there was any coding in our curriculum is we made it part of our teacher education program. So in our teacher education program, about one third of the time you spend doing math and coding. And other universities have, have did that as well uh, before it became an issue. Uh, so because we wanted to respond to to the, the idea that you're going to learn to code, you know, adding something new, a new, a new curriculum in elementary, let's say, as opposed to adding a new tool that will help you do something else, you know? So, uh, so there, there have been movements. Try, uh, so we have a tradition of doing that in some universities in Ontario. And now I think all faculties of education are, are doing this. Yes. Yeah, we're doing it too in most universities in New South Wales, but because it is embedded within the science uh, syllabus, it is in the science teaching methods for primary and in science for secondary. So mathematics teachers uh, only learn to code if they take a sign elective, not. And, and it's because the way it's conceptualized in the syllabus as coding as a separate skill, not as something that helps you with other things that you're doing and I, I think this is a very very important distinction whether we are thinking of mathematics of computer science or coding in general or computing as something that we learn separately and then we apply or as a tool that we can use to help us with things like mathematics so there is that interplay and it's really quite difficult to detangle I think Onam, do you want to say anything, Onam? Or it's good? You're muted. Uh, I I was communicating with Kitty, so I was pay I was not paying attention to the question. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Could you ask the question again if you know? Or, or maybe we go to the last question, Kitty, and then. Uh, okay, uh, the last question was about teacher education. So how do we uh, help teachers or teacher candidate to uh, effectively teach uh, mathematics and coding? Could I say something? Having taught many Please. teachers over the years, Richard and I had one maxim. You don't teach something until you've experienced it yourself. So you actually do the coding or the programming yourself. So you know a bit what you're talking about. So you don't just copy down the code. So everybody who went on our MicroWorlds course, they would be engaged, hands-on stuff to think about. And then they think about how they could use it in their practice. So I'll shut up now, but I think it's a really important maxim. Don't just talk about it, do it. Yes. Thank you, Celia. Onam, do you want to comment on that? Uh, here in Korea, uh, the you know, professional development is very important. And um, so 
uh, usually some um, programs are, you know, is integrated program, math teachers and computer science uh, see, uh, teachers have uh, the same program of computer. So we are trying to, to integrate the mathematics and informatics curriculum. That means that some of the uh, programs that is related to only mathematical concepts. Uh, also, uh, we have some foundation, uh, Korean uh, the foundation of advancement of uh, in science and creativity. Uh, uh, the foundation support teachers for teachers teach coding with themselves. So that kind of a movement or program help for math teachers or computer teachers working together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Onam. And um, unfortunately, our time is up. So I want to thank you, Onam, in Korea, uh, Simon, Elena, George, Richard and Celia, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the online, um, simp the fields is continuing. So that will be Kitty and we will have our own things here. And we have some gifts for our panel, um, in-person panelists and lots of virtual gifts <laughs> to the ones online <laughs> from the heart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the online audience, please uh, stay with us. Uh, this, uh, Celia and Richard could uh, stay a little longer with us for questions uh, because we do have uh, a couple of questions that we uh, didn't deal with. Um, and you're welcome to ask more questions if you have something in mind. Okay, so we just... Uh, Onam, are you staying with us? <laughs> I'm really, I'm really sorry. It's uh, 1 a.m. here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I am in my office, so, so I got a home. Okay. <laughs> I got to go you. home. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yes. Bye. Thank you for your invitation. Bye. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we do have a, another question from Howard. Um, so he's He's saying uh, kids often uh, treat their peers who are good at math to be nerds, but those who are talented uh, artists to be cool. How do they consider those who have a talent for a creative coding? Um, Richard and Celia? You start, Richard. Oh, thank you, Celia. Um, <laughs> And to, to be honest with you, there aren't that many. Uh, there is, if you mean really gifted kids, it's not me. But um, I, we have seen, I would say, the biggest surprise at the beginning of the scratch work was that, um, scratch maths work, was that there were in every class three or four kids who would could be called gifted. Whereas in, in a normal math class, if you ask the teacher what, what's going on, they say, oh, well, the, most of the kids can't cope and so on. We, in every class, we found what, a few who did. That, that doesn't prove anything, but I think, now, in terms of strategy, you need to ask a real teacher, not me. The other thing we did find, Richard, that over and over again, you get a talented kid doing scratch math stuff, you know, programming and sharing. So it's not just programming and doing maths, it's actually sharing it and collaborating it and, you know, doing a project, all those things. But often they were invisible. People, you know, because they, they people tend to know all that they're the ones who are good at maths. And they'll be round about in the class, these other kids who would really do rather good stuff. And nobody really noticed it before, but because it's a bit more visible doing your programming, and do you remember, there was lots of, they think, well, really, we didn't know that that girl was rather good at that, but she sort of worked way in the corner. So I do think it's a way of showing more people, um, showing their creative talents. that They might not be seen in, in the mass classroom. And that's really what we want. We need more people this day and age who are good at maths in the broadest sense. 
A quick note, Kitty, we have unmuted the uh, the current participants. So if it's easier uh, to, to have the questions come in live, uh, I'll leave that to you. Uh, okay, uh, we do have two more. I have one, uh, no, I have one more question and uh, one comment. Uh, so one question uh, was uh, asked uh, right after Onam's uh, response. Um, so I heard uh, ONM about what was done to equip teachers to teach CT in South Korea. What about other contexts? Are you aware of governments and other organizations doing things to support teacher professional learning in coding and CT? Uh, what about in the uh, the British context? <laughs> you say the question again very slowly. I missed some of it. The the oh, okay. audience went out. Sorry. Uh, so the question is that um, in South Korea, uh, teachers were supported to teach CT. What about other context? Are you aware of governments or other organizations doing things to support teachers professional learning coding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, in, in England, it's not United Kingdom, but certainly in England, there's an organization called the National Center for Computing Education. Now, I'm on their academic board, and they will fund courses in computing for teachers across the piece from primary, secondary, up until 18. And they've also been devised exams in computing. And they organize professional learning for the teachers they go to what's called hubs and they all they do courses and they do really really well and they they're very well received but it's like a drop in the ocean really if you want everybody I mean I, I think it's like with maths we want to have in primary schools we want somebody who's like the um you know the um waving the banner for computing just one or two teachers who who can see the point of it and then can come and sit by your side as you're trying to start and feeling very lacking in confidence. It's really, I mean, I, I was lucky. I don't know if lucky or unlucky, but Richard and I learned a lot of our programming together. And so I would be stuck and then he'd help me. You do need someone to say, have you thought about that? Exactly the same as in maths. You're struggling with a maths problem. And you're, you want somebody to say, look, I just need a hint about what do I do with this? And you, do, you just say, well, have you thought of that? And it's that sort of thing we're trying to do across England. But it's a huge amount. It's undoubtedly a challenge. But hopefully, and then I'll shut up and pass it. Um, every now and again, we, Rich and I, meet a teacher or teacher educator in some part of the country, way away from London, who's still doing stuff um, that we talked about years ago and is still doing them in their classrooms and maybe they've gone on to study more. It's just we didn't know about it because they're just getting on with their job, which is a pretty challenging job. And I think probably... I get sometimes over depressed about everything is not very good, but it's probably more political than anything else. I think there is a lot going on around because there are groups of schools who get together and do do rather good stuff, actually. Sorry, Richard, it's your turn. Sorry. Just a quick word. I don't know about anybody else who's online now, but I find it very hard to walk around a class of 25, 30 kids and instantly see what this kid's doing wrong and maybe they could expand this and they could abstract there and so on. I mean, it's bad enough when you have to do that in advanced mathematics, but to do it in computing, which I'm not qualified to do really, um, only to say that there is a big job that needs to be done for teacher education on this subject. And um, there, are, I, my impression is there are places that little isolated spots in the world that are making some real progress on this and others which are um, not. <laughs> I'm worried too about um, chat BTG because I, I think the word from America is it's gonna become a wonderful way of getting rid of math teachers, all teachers. 
Um, and I'm a bit worried that that might happen. You never know. Yeah. I do want to say one actually little thing, more positive. Uh, things that George said, I think when we when we did a lot of our stuff with programming way back, we used to always start from scratch. I mean, from, you know, you begin build your program up. And I think more and more, I think George showed us, but I think Andy certainly he calls it open toolkits and we've called it, Cronis Kinegos called it half-baked micro world. But what we should do more and more is we as designers and as educators together, we design groups of, um, so we have uh, some tools, some programs, and we put them all together and then you say, you debug them, change them, extend them. And I think that is somehow uh, a better way forward now for more, more students and more learners. Thank you, uh, Celia and Richard. Uh, we do have a comment that, that is a, a positive note from Christina in uh, Portugal. So she's teaching math with computational thinking. And she says, I don't know what my students' results will be, but classes are going very well. Um, I have all the students working with motivation, uh, those, uh, even those who have difficulty no. with mathematics. Right. Uh, yeah, and then she's happy with uh, what she's doing. Um, um, she says, I think this is important for me and for her, for her students. That's great. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, note. Uh, so we, we do have a question from Jesse. You want to, uh, cause you're unmute. Oh, I think you're muted. So you can- Oh, can you hear me now? And then we'll take question from Howard. Thank you. So uh, it was so great. Uh, so when I, I'm, the reason I'm here, uh, my background is pure mathematics, but I'm going to teach uh, the uh, general mathematics for software development uh, next term. So, and also uh, at this point, I'm, I'm what I'm trying to do is actually sort of try to make math classroom more integrated with other like more relevant uh, questions that I found when I looked at uh, this uh, um, math education forum, I thought I, I should come and hear how other people are doing. And I'm so glad that people are really saying every uh, unpleasant issues. And I think most of the things were actually uh, spoken. And so when I see South Korea, I think South Korea presented how informatics and math education got historically overlapped and how math, math education actually uh, got uh, that coding in the math classroom and also friends, I think they pointed out as a challenge at the end of these all activities, like, and then at the end of like, what was the learning objectives? And I think Richard, actually, I'm so glad I wish uh, actually, I uh, know oh George uh, from Western University, I believe he showed a very good way to actually I think he even coined that word mathematically deep. I think, so my understanding is we are giving math learning experience to the students. And somehow when students are like kind of like moving all these blocks at the end of the 50 minutes, so what? So we just solved this simple equation. So I think this one is actually going to that of the students who, who became very com like complaining why are we doing this one? This should be math, and why? Why do we have to? For example, now I'm I'm also uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested in putting the sustainable development goals in math education. And once I looked at the YouTube short, and one student got so angry. Why should I have to learn social justice in math class? And I think that she has some point too. So I, I this gave me so many questions. Like, how can I uh, sort of like make our learners? this is very worthy for you. The only way is giving them some kind of experience. But then uh, I think the, the panelists from Australia, she made a very strong comment, right? We cannot change the way we teach unless the paradigm of assessment is changing. And, but, so I think the reason as an educator, we come here and try to learn is, is most of the time, we, our, the setting is actually not allowing us 
to do this, like for a regular classroom with it. But when we actually get the opportunity, like me, uh, finally, I will get out of a multi-section calculus which I'm so bound to following the common assessment that now I can actually have autonomous uh, to actually create all these different assessments. So I guess that's why we come here and learn more things when actually we can use it. But then I guess, uh, so let me go back to my questions so that I can gain something more. I think it, both of them are actually related to uh, uh, George from Western University. Uh, I hope that uh, maybe some of you may. So he gave us a very good way to actually promote mathematical deep classroom because he he began with the overarching topic at the beginning, which is the very mathematical foundation, right? The limit. But then eventually he brought up coding as a tool to actually learn more about it. And I wonder if we can get more resources because he said we, uh, we I bring up these puzzle questions and blah, blah in the middle way to get to coding. I wonder if we can get more resources uh, if he hears that uh, his community is willing to share because those are actually very necessary for us if we want to use those. And actually I Googled uh, to, to get to the web pages, but so far I found two web pages, CP Math and CT Math, and it's not clear which one is actually uh, holding those resources. So I will be great if the organizer can give us a right way to actually get those resources uh, that people are willing to share. And the second question is, so, uh, so Georgie said, why don't we start with a small group of, like it's just a small thing, but I believe in, in Canada, at least in Ontario, like the K-12, some special programs, for example, IB, I don't think that this is only for Canada. The, the students who are in IB program, they actually have a very good assessed experience. Like for example, when they learn calculus, they, uh, as a, an assessment, they have to make a model of roller coaster, something like that. So the teacher, I mean, it's good to give them, but in reality, the teacher can give them such project because the teacher has the capacity to give them feedback. And this thing is not happening in the regular, I believe in the regular uh, high school. And I was sort of want, so even if, I mean, there, it's happening in a, some special program, but not on a general uh, regular uh, uh, public school system. I wonder why is that so? And then we may all say it's political. We don't have enough money. So, so then, so even if we think that's a solution, what's the point of it? There's a wall we can uh, break, or is there any way we can actually make it happen? So uh, we talk about teacher education. But even if a teacher at teachers come to a wonderful conference and learn all this stuff, but if there is elephant in the room that they do not have capacity, we can give them those activities, but we don't have capacity to give them feedback. So we can actually even start giving the, this project to the students, then it's it's a very sad end story. So I was wondering if uh, if uh, George could actually say those things about uh, this this issue. Sorry, uh, I think George is not here though. So I, I have a, those two questions. Uh, uh, Jesse, sorry, uh, George is not with us because uh, uh, George is not attending online. Uh, let's see if uh, Celia and uh, Richard could say something. Uh -huh. I'm absolutely sure that George will share his resources. I can't imagine he wouldn't. And so presumably somebody could facilitate that. But resources are only just the beginning. As, you, as the last speaker said, it's only the beginning. It's good to start with good activities, but then you've got to find other people to work with and work with them yourself. I mean, but it is a good start. Richard, you wanted to say something? No, only to say that she is so enthusiastic and committed she's 90% of the way there already. Yes. We just need to clone more people like this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so Howard, and then we have uh, Francisco. Uh, this is for, I think, following on Celia's comment. 
And it has to do with why kids want to learn math or anything. And I think it, a large thing that we're missing is the social aspect, which is why I talked about cool kids and asked about cool kids and, and nerds. Because the technical subjects, which are largely invisible, seem to be generate low status and outsider status. Whereas things like music and art and writing to some extent generate higher status, athletics certainly. Um, so the question I have that I'd like you to explore is how to move from the low status, I'm cool yeah. subject to the high status, cool subject. And that I think has to do with how the work is presented how the teachers react and how it's shared. And I, when you are dealing with a technical subject, it's really difficult. But if we ignore the emotional aspect of the kids' desire to, to fit in, we miss everything. There's nothing else we can do if we don't tackle the social aspect in the classroom. So I'm wondering how you, how you deal with that. Are you from Canada? Yes, I am. Yeah, so unfortunately you've inherited British empiricism. Um, <laughs> I, that, this is one of the big questions of our time, isn't it? Is there really such a divergence between the arts and the sciences anymore? Um, I, I think probably it needs people slightly more up the food chain than you and me to solve that problem. But it's definitely the case that you, you have, I, I must say, I think there's very little difficulty in saying to kids, what you've just done is incredibly creative. And they know about the creative industries and they know about creative games designers and so on. Whereas it's very hard to say to kids, God, look at the proof of that theorem, isn't it wonderful? Because often it isn't wonderful. Um, and I think being able to appreciate beauty and so on Sounds floppy, but I think it is important. In fact, it's probably more important as a reason for learning maths and computing than it is for learning learning any other subject, many other subjects. So I'm being optimistic for once. I, I think it, it must change. There was one thing I didn't quite understand, yes, actually, how, Howard. Certainly in our country, maths is very high status. Everybody has to do it. And in fact, our prime minister announced only a few weeks ago that even more people have to do it. I mean, thought everybody did it anyway, but now he's changing. Even It's very regarded as terribly important. But the trouble is it then has this emotional. Um, it's not emotionally very good because people just do it because they have to. And oh. they don't know why. And then they're told that they can earn more money and it's all very extrinsic. So I, this is why, in a way, what we're talking about at this seminar here and what Brock certainly have done with their MICA course and their other courses or your program, you really do see why. You really can model a phenomenon. You can really sort of predict things. Um, I never, I'm going to tell you one story and then I know there's other questions. Uh, when I was president of the Institute of Mathematics Applications, I remember what an applied mathematician said to me, well, all the maths tells us that there will be a new planet going up in the appearing in that sky. If we put the telescope, it was it wasn't the latest. It was a humble one. It wasn't the James Webb. If we point that telescope in that direction, we will see a new planet because math says. And blow me, they did it, and there was a planet. So I think it's those sort of things you go, wow. This is why the subject is so powerful, and you know you're opening up new vistas. So I think we all need to have a wow, and the wow is different, whether it's um, building a computer game or whether it's, you know, exploring a proof or whatever. That's what I think. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Celia and uh, Richard. Uh, Francisco, uh, we can take your question now. Thank you. I guess my question relates to equity. I'm just um, wondering if you have anything to say, Celia and Richard, about, um, and if you've seen this maybe with um, teachers sometimes in classrooms, and I'm thinking K to eight, but even K to 12, um, introducing coding, teaching coding or computational thinking, and um, 
you know, introducing a rich task, but sometimes um, is really only, they're really only engaging the top students. There's a, you know, the, the students who are maybe weak or struggling, maybe sometimes that's a large percentage even of the classroom, are not really engaged, are not really uh, getting it. Um, anything, do you have anything to say about that? Any, uh, and um, do you see that happening and do you see solutions to that problem? Dili, are you gonna start or shall I? You start, no, you start. <laughs> well, I think that one of the big surprises of watching kids learning to program, at least in, under certain circumstances, which are a positive outlook on things and so on, but one of the big surprises is there's no evidence anywhere, either that we've seen or is in the literature, that girls do worse than boys. They not only don't do, don't do worse, they uh, do at least as well and sometimes better. So that, that's a surprise because if you only read the literature about maths education, you would have seen 25 years, 20 years ago, I've probably got that number wrong, senior. Um, the, Girls are underperforming, girls don't do maths. Uh, now I think there's slightly more girls doing maths A level than there is boys. So it can be done. And I would guess that, um, yeah, I, I would guess that there's, there is no evidence of underachievement, especially on the basis of uh, on girls and boys. Now, the bigger issues of, of equity. Um, I must say that when I when I saw the word equity in the title of the conference, I thought it's going to be really interesting to see what it is they can say about equity that couldn't be said or couldn't be said as well in the context of some other subject. And maybe that's okay. All subjects should tackle the question of equity. But I can't see, I'd love somebody to show me, I can't see what it is about particular approaches to programming that's going to help in the general equity issue because it's just so huge. In fact, just to add to your question, I mean, in the, in the Scratch Maths project that um, Elena is uh, is working on now in, in Australia, or was working on, and we, we had, um, it was a three year project, very well funded project. It was wonderfully fun. And we, it was very, very um, strictly evaluated because it was government money or I don't know. And they found no evidence of um, girls doing worse than boys or discrimination or even with the lower, I can't remember what was the, the term we had for, for kids who are come from poorer backgrounds. They did better. And the only reason we could think why, because there was a very strong pedagogical framework now, and also you, we had good teachers. The teachers were trained in the Scratch Maths project and they were trained not only in the in Scratch Maths and in the tasks, they were trained in pedagogy. So, and so they were, they were aware. And one of the things is we have, what was it? I got it a while ago. It's we had called the five E's. Yeah. You know, I don't and, know. Yeah. And I don't, can't remember what they are now. Um, uh, oh, I can't, I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> and, but I mean, it was because they were focusing on the pe pedagogy and that pedagogy underlying it was, was make sure everybody is involved. So you had to engage and collaborate and whatever. So I think it's the tasks that some, you know, George did wonderful tasks and I know that he would have proven it, but it's alongside it. It's a pedagogy where you, when you're doing the tasks, you're being aware of what all the kids are doing and how you're making sure that everybody can contributes and collaborates and um, extends what other people say and listens. So it, that, it, all social skills as well. Yeah. But hopefully that would happen in any lesson on any yeah, subject. Yeah, yeah. But, um, well, yes, hopefully. Yeah. I don't know if that's answered your question, Francesco, has it? So. Yes, that's the question there. <laughs> pardon me, I beg your pardon? Richard? Said, Celia said, I hope that answers your question. I said, I doubt it. It's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I was also thinking in particular about um, with George's uh, 
exercise is very rich, but I, I worried about the students, the struggling students, and I don't necessarily mean um, gender or um, socioeconomic status, just the ones per perhaps who are uh, struggling more academically, conceptually. Here's the funny thing. Celia has already mentioned it, and we don't have millions of examples of this, even three or four. But this particular school that Celia mentioned is extraordinary. We went in, and it's just a school, and teachers are just teachers, and primary. No, early secondary. And um, we, we, Celia and I w walked around the room, engaged the kids in chat, what are you doing, what are you building, and so on. And, um, the teacher unsolicited sort of walked past one of us, I can't remember who, and said, she's useless, she's, she's, she's a real problem in class, which I, I thought was out of order actually to say to a visitor, but never mind. Next time we went in, guess who was running on the kids' side, the, the sort of help yourself um, sessions? Who, who, who was it that the kids went to? in terms of other kids, who did they regard as the experts? This girl. Now, of course I can't prove there's anything to do with scratch maths, and maybe it didn't, maybe something wonderful happened in her home life that made it life a lot better, but we do, have, it adds up. I think there are kids around, and you meet lots of kids who are now in their twenties who say, learning logo made me think differently about maths. I meet lots of them. About one a week, I'd say. Yeah, and also it does build your self-esteem. I mean, this little, this girl that Richard was talking about, she had no self-esteem at all. But now she was, I don't know what the transition was, but she no. suddenly was somebody who the teacher, instead of picking on and saying you're not very good, was saying, oh, look, look at your work. So I think the that's... The teacher what doesn't about... this happened, by the way. I don't think the teacher realised uh, that... Uh... So to answer your question, Francesca, I think you have to have really good tasks, which there are a lot about. And as somebody said in the in the panel earlier, there are probably too many. There's so much. We've always had that problem in maths. So I think you have to. I'm not one for kite marking. I think we did talk about it in England. That's we would kite mark materials, but God, it's so difficult. And uh, it's also partly because it's also a matter of profits for the publishers. So. I'm not sure that's the right way, but somehow or other, you need to get groups of teachers who will take ownerships of particular um, curriculum, and they, they're the ones they really like, and they're the ones that they can champion it, and uh, then I think it should be all right. No, no. Thank you very much. I know, Kitty, we're probably getting to the end of our, of our uh, time over here. Um, but uh, I just wanted to add a quick uh, uh, kind of addition to uh, the question from Francisco. So I think there is an interesting kind of tension there regarding um, when you are uh, engaging in more unstructured tasks, especially as what uh, George was, was referring to. I think there's a real question of how do you assess whether students are gaining or not uh, during that process? And I think there's a, there's a real judgment from the teacher. Uh, that we rely on to kind of see that. And, and then every teacher is going to have a different way of being able to perceive that. And that's going to be con conditional on their classroom, like the relationship they have with their students. This is the beginning of the year, end of the year. So I think there's a, some interesting factors that come about uh, uh, from coming from that. Mm, you're right. You're right. But I think that's good. We'll have, we ought to have more teacher assessment and uh... Because teachers are the ones who really will know whether this is, first of all, interesting, and secondly, their work. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think uh, it's time to close the session. Um, very, uh, we're very appreciated uh, for the uh, Celia and uh, Richards. You're, uh, you stay longer with us. Uh, many, many thanks to you too. Uh, and uh, we'll keep in touch for resources, materials, and uh, we'll see uh, what what else uh, uh, the requests from. Uh, sometimes we'll have requests from our uh, audience. Uh, we'll let you know what they ask, um, and we'll keep in touch. Uh, hopefully, we we'll get more people on board on this on this matter, <laughs> and that's the hope. Uh, we prove that it can be done online, even if it, wow. something goes wrong. <laughs> no, wonderful. It's been a really engaging time here. We're just very sorry we weren't 
over there with you all. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Up here, so it's as well. So we we ought to get out in the sun, Richard. We haven't seen any sun for ages, so it's really. So you do British weather at its best. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> looks beautiful. Blue sky. Yeah. At okay, last. Have good, well, have, for us, it's have a good evening. Yeah, have a good evening or have a good day. Thank you. Hope to see you sometime. Good luck in all your work, and thank you for the questions. Thank you, Celia and Richard. Bye. Thank, thank you. you all.